camera perspective. It's pretty sensitive, so you don't okay. have to. All right, folks, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I appreciate folks coming out uh, for our first seminar speaker of the season here. So this is our opening day for the seminar season. Uh, my name is Bill Walton. I'm over at the Shellfish Lab, and uh, I am um, have the privilege today of introducing Jim Steckel, uh, who's a colleague. And so Jim and I go back. We both had done work with zebra mussels many, many, many years ago, and I knew Jim, and the winding roads of academia led us both in the end to uh, Auburn, uh, the School of Fisheries, Aquaculture, and Aquatic Sciences. Um, I wish I had an embarrassing story about Jim. Um, the most embarrassing story I have about Jim is actually about me. Uh, uh, Jim and I had the opportunity to go to a marine lab in uh, British Columbia. We were out in Vancouver Island. And it was one of these complicated long flight out to Vancouver, and then you had to get on one of those puddle jumpers and get over. So this was this pretty complicated process for getting there, complicated more by getting university approval for international travel. I got to the airport early. I was in line, ready to check in, and I reached for my passport and opened it up. Saw my wife's, my wife's face <laughs> on the passport, and the, all the blood went to my face. I know I was bright red because I realized there was nothing I could do now to fix this. Like, I was not going to make that because there was no way I could get back to Daphne and back to Pensacola in that time. So I just had to walk up to that lady and say, I'm an idiot. Um, I'm not making today's flight because I don't have the proper passport. What are my solutions? And she was very nice and, and put me on the plane the next day, but that left Jim waiting in Vancouver with somebody he didn't know, I think. Uh, so I appreciate Jim putting up with my inability to get the correct passport. Bill, Bill always gets me these kind of... <laughs> A green muscle situation. Yes, we've, uh, yeah, we've, we've, uh, you should not trust me. So anyway, um, I thought it would be great to have Jim come down. I know this is a freshwater species and I know we're a marine lab, but I think there's some lessons here. And by the way, some of you may have bumped into Jim this summer. He came down and taught um, marine aquaculture here for the summer. So. You know I'm not an aquaculture. That's right. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all for, for coming out. Can you all hear me back there fine? Okay. Uh, so I guess this is the first seminar, so I'm going I'm to try to set the bar pretty low so uh, <laughs> people who follow me are, are going to be all right. So this is going to be a little bit of a, of a non-traditional talk. So I'm not going to talk about one project in detail and amaze you all with how much I learned. It's going to be kind of the opposite of that. So um, I've had a chance to meet with a lot of really good people this morning and and I found out that I'm not, not alone. Uh, so my training is in ecology, but I always kind of joke that ecology taught me a lot of theory, but not how to really do anything useful. And so, um, so I've gradually been branching out and trying to learn about a little bit about physiology and engineering techniques, and then have found that those really um, can provide a lot of useful information and insights into ecology and conservation ecology. And more importantly, a lot of times they help lead to really important questions to start researching down the road. So I'm going to go over uh, basically three exploratory studies that we've done that kind of illustrate that combination of physiology and engineering and how, how that can be used to provide insight into conservation and uh, kind of focus on the, some of the questions um, that those studies have led to. So in my lab, we do a lot of work with um, thermal and hypoxia tolerance. So the question is always, why, sh why should we care about that? Why is that important? So some of you may know there, there are some fringe uh, elements in the scientific establishment who uh, believe that the climate is changing. And so just in case they're right, we, we study that in my, in my lab. And this is a really important uh, issue because of that, for aquatic organisms especially, because of that relationship between DO and temperature. So as temperature goes up, the amount of oxygen that's dissolved in the water, um, say at 100% saturation, decreases. And so the amount of available oxygen starts to decrease as well. 
even all of that is not available for an organism because below a certain level, it's too low to sustain life. So they're getting pinched more and more into that decreasing amount of available oxygen. Then there's a section of increasing risk right above this level. And so a really important question then is, what is a safe level of oxygen for aquatic organisms, and when do we start reaching that level? So for me, uh, one of the things we were interested in was how much oxygen do crayfish actually need. So the ability to extract oxygen is generally placed into one of two categories. So this is when the, where the physiology starts to come in. So if an animal is a regulator, it is able to maintain a constant respiration rate regardless of dissolved oxygen. So this graph shows respiration rate on the x-axis and then dissolved oxygen going from 100% saturation to anoxia on the x-axis. And you can see that this animal is maintaining a constant respiration rate as DO declines, so it's regulating its oxygen. It's able to get as much as it needs as that oxygen declines. But then at a certain level, they reach that critical dissolved oxygen threshold. Below that level, they're not able to extract as much as they need, and their respiration rate starts to decline pretty rapidly. And eventually, that will lead to increased stress and ultimately death. Confirmation is when the respiration rate is continually declining with declining DO. So this shows the same thing, but for an animal that would be more of a conformer, where at 100% saturation, they're getting a lot of oxygen, but then as DO declines, they're able to get less and less oxygen from that water, and then eventually even they will reach a, a DO crit as well. So it's kind of important to know the patterns that these animals are following when you're trying to figure out how much oxygen they actually need. In reality, most animals are not perfect regulators or conformers. So if we have, so MO2 is the same thing as, as respiration rates. So if we have respiration rate on the Y axis and DO on the X, a perfect regulator is going to maintain that constant respiration rate, and a perfect conformer is going to have a declining respiration rate with declining DO. But most animals have a curve that follows somewhere in between. And so that ability to regulate is really on a gradient. It's not an either or type of thing. And so there's a, uh, an index called a regulation index that came out in 2011 that's a really useful way to look at this. And it assigns, there's a way to analyze that data and you can actually quantify the ability to regulate to where an animal with perfect regulation has a value of one. And then as that ability to regulate starts to decrease, the regulation index starts to decrease all the way down to uh, if an animal is a perfect conformer and has a value of zero. So it's a scale of, of zero to one. So we were looking at um, oxygen uh, consumption patterns of Camberus halli, which was a species of concern in Alabama. It's a rare species. And, and I learned how to do respirometry, but pretty quickly we ran into some big problems because we were getting just this huge array of patterns for the same species of crayfish that were collected in the same area in about the same time. So anywhere from an animal like this that's able to regulate pretty well down to a DO of about three to this animal that was a, a perfect conformer. All right, so, it's, so that makes it very difficult to assess respiratory patterns and needs of a single species, and it's even more difficult to compare between species because of that variation. So we had to kind of put the brakes on that project and try to figure out why were we getting this really high variation amongst our individuals. And so one thing that we all know, I think everybody in this room knows, is that crustaceans molt to grow. But I think because it's such common knowledge, a lot of times that is, is just kind of swept under the rug. Yeah, I know crustaceans molt, but I'm not really worried about that. But we thought that that might actually be a really important consideration when investigating hypoxia tolerance. So this is the stages of the molt cycle. So in the inner molt period, the animals have a single connected uh, exoskeleton. And then during the pre-molt stage, the old antecuticle starts to separate, um, and then it gets absorbed. And then late pre-molt, you get the formation of the new endocuticle. The animal then molts, and during post-molt, it, it swells and, and hardens, right? So we've all learned this in intro biology. This pre-molt stage, or these three stages here, actually account for about 50% of the molt cycle or more. So I had always assumed that most animals were in the intermolt stage, but that's actually not true. Most of the time, they're under this process. 
of that endocuticle separating and being absorbed. The gills also go through the molt process. So it makes sense then that oxygen requirements are likely strongly affected by molt stage. And so we wanted to track molt stage in individual crayfish. Um, so to do this, we held crayfish in hamster balls. And so they were kind of rolling along in their tanks. And, uh, but we were able to keep track of individuals. And then also, um, and actually, if any of you guys track molt stage here, I'd be really interested in talking to you. So this is the way that we kind of did it. We took weekly photos of the Europod CD to determine molt stage. So this animal is in intramolt. This was 30 days after the molt. And you can see there's no separation between the old and the new cuticle. The epidermal tissue is, a, a patch, is attached to these cetal cones. When we get into late pre-molt, so this is one week before the molt, you can see the new CD are beginning to form. So this is pretty obvious, and we could tell that this animal was, was getting ready to molt. And then if we put that under a, uh, a compound rather than a dissecting scope, you could actually see that separation between the old cuticle and the new cuticle. So this was a nice visual tool to kind of figure out exactly what stage our, our crayfish were in. You can see that separation and, again, that new cuticle. And so then we would uh, measure respiration rates of crayfish at different stages through that mold cycle to find out what those, those patterns were. So this is the uh, kind of the diagram I showed you earlier. And we found, I'm just going to show you some kind of characteristic graphs for these different stages. So during intermold, the animals had a very low respiration rate. And they had a great typically a very moderate to very high ability to regulate. So respiration rate was low, but fairly steady. And then the DO crit was oftentimes somewhere around one milligram of oxygen per liter. So they were able to regulate pretty well to low DO. Once they got to the late pre-molt, we would often see um, strong confirmation and a very elevated respiration rate. And then when they were soft after the molt, we saw kind of an, an in-between to where they had a still an elevated respiration rate. They were starting to regulate a little bit, but not as good as before. So depending on what stage they were in, which you couldn't really tell just by picking them up and feeling them, you actually had to examine them under the scope. It made a huge difference in terms of what the respiratory patterns were. And so this suggests that when they're in the intermolt, which in the literature, this is where most of the respiratory studies are done, or at least they say this is what stage they're in. This stage is actually least susceptible to low DO events because they're able to regulate very well. Their oxygen demand is low. But during that late pre-molt, through-molt, and post-molt, they, sh they should be very susceptible to low DO events because they have a very high energy demand and they can't regulate that oxygen consumption very well. So this has actually a lot of implications for conservation and some questions for, for further research. And so one main thing that, you know, so I'm asked a lot by folks, you know, how much oxygen does this organism need? And so if dissolved oxygen guidelines are based on the literature, uh, so if you look up respiratory patterns of crayfish in the literature, but it's all based on hard intramolt crayfish, that may not actually be protective of pre-molt to post-molt stages. And so our recommendation now after this study is to base the guidelines on the most sensitive stage, which would be those late pre-molt to post-molt crayfish. There's also some interesting questions as to whether or not there are links between physiology and behavior. So crayfish, like uh, blue crabs, for example, are very cannibalistic. They're most vulnerable to predation during and after the molt when they're soft. And they oftentimes will seek shelter in, in, uh, in burrows or nooks and crannies um, while they molt to get away from uh, cannibalistic uh, conspecifics, but there's reduced water exchange in those environments, and so they risk localized oxygen depletion right when they need oxygen the most. And so this raises some really interesting ecological questions as to whether there are trade-offs between predation risk and low DO stress. So when you're molting, where do you go? Do you go to a shelter, reduce your predation risk, but increase your chances of uh, harm due to hypoxia, or do you avoid those hypoxic areas and then um, but increase your risk of predation. And so that might have a lot to do with how many predators are in the system and so on. So a lot of really cool questions we can look at now. And, and also in terms of habitat availability, um, the, the survival of crayfish of a population through the molt might actually be very dependent not only on the availability of kind of interstitial spaces and rocky environments like we think of, but the availability of 
shelter areas that have high oxygen content in there so that they don't have to go out of those those places. So this is all speculation, but it's an example of kind of some some nice um, questions we can ask from from this data. And then um, I, this is the tool we used to determine molt stage. So I'd be interested if any of you all use this or have other ways to do this. I'd be interested in talking with you. So we can we can identify this through Europod CD. It's a little bit difficult, um, but it works reasonably well. And you could use this to determine whether your animals, your population is undergoing a synchronized molt in the field. And if so, they may be very susceptible to low DO events during that time. So you can pinpoint those seasonal times where we want to really avoid low DO. Or other populations undergo asynchronized molts. And low DO events, events for those populations may not be as important because even if they happen, a good proportion of the population is not molting at that time, and so they would be able to survive those low DO events and repopulate. So tracking whether populations are synchronized or asynchronized would have a lot of uh, implications. And so finally, when assessing intra and intraspecific differences in hypoxia tolerance of crayfish, we found that knowledge of that mold stage is, is critical. So another question is, what are the optimal and stressful temperatures for attacks of interest? And so I always tell the managers there's bad news because they always want to know one temperature. And, and then I have to say there, there is no single optimal temperature or stressful temperature. It depends on what you're talking about. And so this makes it really difficult to assess whether temperatures are good, bad, harmful, or, or not harmful. And so use of guiding kind of theoretical frameworks can be really useful for putting this information together. And so that's something that we're trying to figure out is what kind of useful framework can we put all of this information in. So one framework that gets a lot of attention are adverse outcome pathways, or AOPs. And these link effects at increasing level of organization. So the idea here is that effects of um, stress, like thermal stress, on the physiology of an organism at the cellular, tissue, and organ level can then be linked to, you can then use that information to predict effects on individuals, subpopulations, populations, and communities. So it's this idea of really, instead of conducting your research in a vacuum, really trying to figure out how these stressors are linked to each other up increasing levels of organization. It's not easy to do. A lot of folks are taking an energetics approach to this right now and using dynamic energy budget models to try to do these linkages across these different levels of organization. Another idea that's related um, that we've paid a lot of attention to is this idea, for thermal tolerance anyway, that it decreases with increasing levels of organizational complexity. So the idea here is that thermal tolerance is the highest at the cellular level. So the, the idea is that an enzymes under heat stress may still function, but they may not be efficient enough to allow for organism survival. So the enzymes are surviving, but the organism cannot because they're just not working efficiently enough. And this can be assessed with enzymatic assays. And then we have intermediate tolerance at the individual level where the organism may survive, but growth and reproduction are reduced uh, to where they cannot support sufficient growth and reproduction to support that population. And we can get at this through looking at metabolic patterns. And then finally, the lowest thermal tolerance is at the population level where growth and reproduction are too low to support population growth, and this can be gotten out with growth and reproductive assays. So it's a lot of work to do all of those different assays at one time, and so what we're really interested in is looking at enzymatic assays and then trying to put these upper level um, endpoints into some kind of framework to where if we know what's going on at the cellular level, we can kind of predict what might happen at these increasing levels of organization. So the enzymatic assay that we've been using is, is um, uh, involved in the electron transport system. How many of you learned about the Krebs cycle in ETS? Yeah. I had to admit I didn't learn it very well. I flunked that. And, um, and now it's come back to bite me because now all of a sudden I have to understand it. And uh, I, I still struggle with it a little bit. But I can read a recipe and I can figure out how to do the assay and I have a basic understanding of what this is. But basically, this is at the, inner mitochondri the mitochondrial inner membrane. It comprises an enzymatic series of electron donors and acceptors. And then the, the assay quantifies the activity of those ETS enzymes under conditions of unlimited substrates. So it, in other words, it's, it's kind of giving you an idea of how many electrons can be 
transfer to oxygen under optimal conditions at this temperature. So it gives you an estimate of the major rate-limiting step in respiration, which in turn indicates the potential metabolic activity, or PMA, which is the maximum respiration rate an organism is capable of at that temperature. And this is a really useful parameter. So from here on out, if you see a slide that has either ETS activity or PMA, those are the, the same thing. All right, so we can use that assay to generate thermal performance curves with ETS activity on the x-axis or y-axis and temperature on the x-axis. And so enzyme activity increases with increasing temperature up to a maximum. And so this is the optimal temperature for those enzymes. This is when they're experiencing optimal activity. And then activity starts to decline with increasing temperature. And this is where we say that um, kind of demarcate this as the onset of thermal stress at the enzymatic level, which, remember, is the most thermally tolerant of all those levels that I talked about. So the question of is, is this really true and can this really work? Because I'm always pretty skeptical of, of things. I like to try to test these theories out and see if it really does work. So we wanted to relate this framework to other thermal tolerance endpoints at the organismal level and see if it could be used as a predictive framework for multiple endpoints. And so the idea here is if you have a PMA thermal performance curve, we know what the optimal temperature is, and then we can look at where that PMA is within 90% of the max. So this would be the optimal thermal breadth for the enzymes. And if that theory about decreasing tolerance holds true, then the, at the organismal level, the optimal thermal endpoint should fall to this side of that PMA opt, and then the lethal endpoints should fall on this side. So this could give you, if it works, it could give you a really nice kind of break point. And, and so if you do this assay, you know, okay, the optimal temperature is below this particular range or temperature, and then these lethal temperatures should be above this particular break point. So we were working with um, uh, the Missouri Department of Conservation that was really interested in thermal tolerance of Faxonius eupunctus, which is the cold water crayfish. It's a rare native species. It, it occurs only in a, a single watershed. Its range is about 7,800 kilometers square. Uh, so it's considered vulnerable based on extent of occurrence. And we collected these individuals from the 11 Point River in Missouri. This river is influenced by springs, so it has strong thermal heterogeneity. So if you look, this is temperature on the y-axis and then years on the x-axis. And these different sections represent different parts of the river going from upstream to a downstream direction. So you can see upstream, it's very warm. Then the springs come in, it's very cold, and then it starts to warm up again. So this is a great system for kind of testing all of these ideas out. There's also an invasive species called Faxonius neglectus, the ringed crayfish that is actually native to the United States, but not to that particular watershed. It's moved across watersheds and is now threatening this very narrowly distributed individual. So um, the DNR is very concerned about this, and they were really interested in trying to see if there were differences in thermal optima and thermal tolerances between these species, with the idea being that if they segregated themselves according to thermal optima, then in a system like this, the native species might really occur in one area, whereas the invader is not going to do well in that area and may kind of confine itself to another area. Or if they're the same, then we've really got something to worry about because now the ranges are likely to overlap. So, um, so we were looking for that species to see whether there were different thermal tolerance patterns and is there a potential for a thermal refuge for the native species. So we did the ETS curves. And this actually does represent a lot of work. This is all boiled down into some graphs, but uh, it took quite a bit of time. But anyway, on the, on the top row, we see the ETS activity against temperature. And these are all the individual curves. Um, this is for the native species here and the invasive species. And then on the lower panels, we see the, the kind of mean of those curves. So you can see that there's a lot of individual variation within each population. But on average, these curves are extremely similar to each other. There's not really any difference between the native and the invasive in terms of their 
enzymatic thermal uh, performance curves. And so when we analyzed the data, we found no difference in the optimal ETS temperature, the upper bounds of that optimum, the lower bound of the optimum, or the, the breadth or the width of that optimum. So it, for all practical purposes, these have their enzymes perform in the same way. So what about the optimal and lethal endpoints at the organismal level? So we worked with um, some folks over in Missouri, and then we also looked through the literature. Uh, and in Missouri, they conducted some additional experiments. So Jacob Westhoff and Christopher Rice were two of our main collaborators here. And we hypothesized that those optimal endpoints, such as preferred temperatures, so they did some assays in the lab to see what temperatures the crayfish preferred to be in, and then in the literature, we also found optimal temperature for growth for the native species. And then for lethal endpoints, they, um, they increased the temperature gradually for both species and then uh, measured the critical thermal maximum, which is the temperature at which that crayfish kind of becomes moribund and flips over and it's no longer able to ride itself. So it's not necessarily dead, but it's ecologically dead at that at that point, okay? And so we thought that that would fall over here in this section. So these are the, the enzymatic curves for both species. You can see they're nearly identical. The optimum for the native was 28.5. The optimum for the invader was 28.4, so no, no real difference there. We looked at thermal preference and placed that on the curve, and this was pretty cool. So this met our expectations for Eupunctus. It fell on the uh, right side, the left side of that curve at lower temperatures than the optimal for the enzyme, as predicted. And it occurred right below that enzyme thermal optimal area. For neglectus, we found almost an identical pattern. It fell in the same point on that curve. For the maximum, the temperature for optimal growth, that actually fell right at the upper edge of that um, thermal preference range for the native, and I was not able to get that data for neglectus, but for this species that, that fit our idea. And then we also did um, critical thermal maximum, and we acclimated the animals at different temperatures, because as they get acclimated to higher temperatures, they're able, usually they're able to withstand higher and higher temperatures. So at animals that were acclimated to 10 degrees had a thermal critical level that fell just below the enzymatic optimum level. So this was deadly at the organismal level, optimal at the enzymatic level for both species. At 15, we saw a similar pattern um, right up in this area. And then at 20 degrees, it went lower on the curve, below that optimal line for both species. And then at 25 degrees, we saw, again, it was similar, it was below that line. So very similar patterns between the two species. Um, so that's suggesting that, that they occupy a similar thermal niche and also that these the PMA thermal performance curves may serve as a really useful theoretical and predictive framework that if you know what that curve is, you can start to predict where these other endpoints might lie. And so we're, we're continuing this work with a lot of additional crayfish species at this point. This is only an N of two, it's just two species. Uh, but we have enzymatic curves for probably close to a dozen species right now, and we're trying to collect other uh, organismal thermal endpoints to see if these patterns hold true. So um, this is a map of 11 point river. The size of these dots show where Eupunctus is the most abundant because we wanted to see how this fell out within their thermal performance range. And so it, so to put this in perspective, this is that graph I showed you earlier of the temperature regimes in 11 point river. So this is the thermal preference range. So you can see site one is generally above that, site two is below, sites three and four are kind of getting up into that range, site six is bracketing it, it's right in the middle, and then six and seven are bracketing it as well. And then the optimal growth occurs right here. The PMA, which is the enzyme optimal range, is higher, and then the temperatures never reach this in some of the sites, but they did reach that optimal range at other sites. And then the CTM was very high, and so that was never reached at, at any of the sites. So if you had asked me, I'd say, well, obviously, these are the sites that seem to cl most closely match their thermal preference, so this is where we should have the highest abundance. But of course, anything that makes sense to you sitting in an armchair looking at a computer is never true. 
This is no exception. So actually, this was where we found the highest abundance. It was where the, the maximum temperatures just reached into that optimal thermal preference range, which is pretty interesting. But this gives us a really nice framework and, and kind of some insight as to what kind of thermal regimes these are choosing in relation to both their optimal and um, lethal temperatures. And so now we're kind of keeping an eye on the system to see if that invader, because it also has a very similar thermal range, whether it's also going to predominate at these sites or not. All right, so, um, so those were some examples of some physiological approaches that we're taking. And then this is an area I never thought I'd go into, which is engineering, but has turned out to be a, a lot of fun, actually. So a lot of crayfish species don't actually live in water, which is pretty surprising to a lot of us. We, we grew up, if you're like me, you grew up catching crayfish in streams. Um, but how many of you have seen structures like this, these little chimneys that, that rise up? Um, so a lot of crayfish actually spend all or, or most of their lives underground. So this is a resin cast of a crayfish burrow. And if, if I had this here, it would be about this high. So, uh, so it's pretty big. That crayfish dug all the way down to the groundwater level about here. And the other interesting thing about crayfish is, is they will build chimneys. A lot of times for the species we're looking at, those chimneys are seasonal, so they don't build them all the time. And when they do, mo a lot of times they're only on one entrance but not on both entrances. So for a long time, people just thought that those chimneys were kind of the, just kind of accidental. So it'd be like a dog, you know, digging a burrow, and these chimneys are just piles of dirt that go up. So we built burrowing chambers in my lab that we used to study burrowing crayfish, and you can videotape the crayfish, and you see that they're actually picking up these, excavating these balls of dirt, kind of rolling them into balls. They grab them with their kilopeds and their maxillopeds, and then they walk them to the entrance of the burrow, and they place, when they build a chimney, they place and they pack them very carefully. So it's a very deliberate structure, and we've seen this behavior over and over again. It's pretty cool. So that suggests that these chimneys are actually a very deliberate structure, and they must serve some purpose. So one of the ideas is that, that was put out in the 1980s, is that this is a passive ventilation system. Uh, but and so I talked to the engineers then to kind of try to figure out how this would work. So they said, well, there's, there's basically two ways. One is if there's a temperature gradient between the chimney opening and the non-chimney opening, that's going to set up a difference in density of air, and so you can get flow that way. So we went out on a hot, sunny day, and we measured temperature, and we would get differentials like this, to where it was very hot at the chimney opening, so this one was 25 degrees, and then right next to it at the non-chimney opening, we had about a seven degree difference, so 18 degrees. So that temperature differential was actually set up, but they said even better is this wind-driven pressure differential. So when, I have to, I always kind of mess this part up, so see if I can remember. So when the wind blows over a chimney, it sets up a low pressure zone on the far side of the chimney, and that serves to pull air out of the chimney and draw air into this relatively high pressure zone when there is no chimney at all. So he said that that could work as well. And this has actually been long known for prairie dogs. And I, you know, I'm always surprised that whenever I think I've hit on something new, I look through the literature and somebody has been way before me. And I would say, yeah, Steph, well, everybody knows this, you know, duh. So anyway, it has been long known for prairie dogs, but not, not for crayfish. So we wanted to see if the same kind of thing uh, could be going on here as well. So I worked with the Biosystems Engineering Department, and I, I'm used to undergraduate projects where you give them a very small project to work with, you know, maybe some beakers to mess with. They had their undergrad build a wind tunnel in there. And so <laughs> this is an undergrad project. And so, uh, and then, of course, because engineers don't like anything natural, everything has to be very straight and regular. This is, <laughs> this is awesome. This is a burrow model. This is actually what a burrow looks like. I'll pass this around in a little bit. But, for their purposes, there are some burrows that look kind of like this, and so it, 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 it's an okay model, and it's good for testing these things out. So um, we put turf grass sod on the wind tunnel floor, and then we had one chimney opening and one non-chimney opening. And then uh, we, we put a smoke bomb 
in the wind tunnel to try to track where the air went. And so I'll show you. So when I show this video, it's easier to see the smoke coming out of the chimney if you look at this shadow right here. Okay, and then eventually you'll be able to see this. But keep an eye on that shadow. So we let the smoke bomb, and now all of a sudden you see that smoke coming out, the chimney right there. And so if you look underneath of the wind tunnel, you see that smoke being drawn down into that hole and then right back up where that chimney is. And then eventually, if we ran that long enough, that smoke would also go down below that V. So it was actually a pretty efficient way to just passively, if there was wind, it worked very well for ventilating that burrow. And so, we, so because crayfish actually deliberately build their burrows, they're ecosystem engineers and they build these structures, we were kind of curious as to, you know, what are the, um, what are the ramifications of their choices? So what if they build the wind flowing this way? What if they have the chimney here, not chimney here, it's just perpendicular to the wind versus this orientation versus that orientation? And so because these were engineers, we were able to test that out. So we, we flipped these things around. So this is the perpendicular setup. The wind's coming in this direction. Then we moved the chimney over here to where it was upwind of the non-chimney hole and then downwind of the non-chimney hole, and then measured flow rates of air coming out of the chimney. And we got these really great relationships. So this is velocity from the chimney against wind velocity. And you can see when the chimney is upwind, it works. It ventilates the burrow. But it's a lot more efficient when that chimney is either downwind or perpendicular to that non-chimney opening. So those choices can have a pretty big impact on ventilation. What about uh, chimney height and wind speed? Does it matter how big they build these chimneys? And so uh, we, we ran everything from no chimney at all to a 17 centimeter chimney. And again, we got these really great relationships where the velocity going through the burrow always include increased with wind velocity, but the slope of that line increased the higher the chimney was. So the taller your chimney is, the more air you're getting through your burrow for a given wind velocity. So this is a pretty, pretty cool finding as well. And also there was little to no ventilation when the chimney was absent. All right, so this is a model, okay? And so the real question is, does this actually happen in the, in the real world? So we went out and of course the, the engineers have scientific smoke bombs, which are like, twice as expensive and last half as long as the smoke bomb that I get from the fireworks store, but that's all right. We use their, their scientific ones. And we found a, uh, a burrow with a chimney and on a windy day. And so you can see we let off the smoke bomb and you can see pretty quickly all that smoke coming from that crayfish chimney. And then when we took the chimney off of that hole, so it's the same setup, there's no smoke coming out of that hole anymore. So, so those chimneys in a real world situation really do work and they're pretty efficient for aeration. And this is a picture of, we did a cast of that burrow. So this is what it actually looked like. So the air was coming down here about a half a meter underground. The groundwater level was just a little bit below that. And then the air came back up and it only came out of that entrance with the chimney on it, not those other two entrances. So this is the actual burrow cast. Just for reference, this is a ghost crab burrow, like what you guys see on the beach. So this is the whole burrow. That's just the portion of the crayfish burrow that's above the water line. The whole thing is probably went down to my feet up here. So they're, they're a little bit different from what you might see out on the beach. Okay, so what's the function then? Obviously, it, it seems like the function must be to oxygenate the burrows, right? And so then the question is, what is the oxygen demand? of those crayfish. And luckily, we had done a bunch of physiological experiments, so we had some insight into when they needed the oxygen most. And so if we go back to this mold stage idea, the highest oxygen demand was when they were in late pre-molt to post-molt. This is when the respiration rates were really high, they weren't able to regulate oxygen demand very well, so we could make some predictions then. So we predicted that in burrows with an open chimney, they would, have, um, they would have the greatest airflow, and this is where we should see the late to pre-molt 
individuals. So we hypothesized that they were building these chimneys to aerate the burrows and get oxygen down there during the molt cycle. The brooding females also have eggs attached to their tails, and they have to constantly wave their swimmerettes to aerate the eggs. And so we thought that probably we would find brooding females in these burrows as well. We also noticed a lot of times the crayfish would plug their chimneys. And this was pretty mysterious. It's like, why would you go through the trouble of building that chimney just to plug it? So we had no idea why. <laughs> but for ethical reasons, I have to put that in there, because they do do that, right? And then, uh, and then we saw a lot of burrows with no chimneys. And so from the air tunnel experiments and from our field experiments, we saw that there was little to no airflow. So this is where we thought we would see the intermolt individuals and non-brooding females. All right. So Cambaris polychromatus was our study species. The taxonomy of crayfish is terrible. So this is, this might be a new species pretty soon. It's the, the whole taxonomy is being broken up. But this is what we have at, at our station. And um, this is the kind of habitat they're in. So not a pretty stream. This is my postdoc from Egypt, and I convinced him that this would be a great project. He, uh, his mother back in Egypt was very upset with me. <laughs> she said, he has his PhD. Why are you making him dig out <laughs> in the field? So, but, but we had a lot of fun doing this. And uh, so we dug up 55 burrows um, in March and May over, over two years' time, and we recorded what we got from those burrows, see if it would fit our hypothesis. So remember what I said about when things make sense, be very careful because it's probably not going to happen. So this is no exception. So in our open chimney burrows with the highest airflow, we found zero soft, freshly molded crayfish. In our mystery plug chimneys with no airflow and in our burrows that didn't have a chimney, but they were plugged as well, so no airflow, that's where we found all of our soft females and our soft males. So this is actually where the molting individuals were, was in these, these plug burrows. And then in the um, open chimneys where there's li maybe a little bit of airflow, but not much, again, we found zero soft. So probably what's going on is that those plugs are to prevent predators from coming down and eating those soft crayfish. But that suggests that the whole purpose of that aeration is not to aerate the burrows. This is when they need it most, but this is when they plug their chimneys. And the same thing for brooding females. We found no brooding females in the open chimneys where we pre uh, predicted it. We found one female with glue on her tail. She was just about to lay her eggs in a plugged burrow with no airflow and three buried females in the open chimneys with very little to no airflow. And then the hard, hardened individuals were just scattered randomly through there. So. In conclusion, the chimney function was not to meet the high oxygen demand during molting or brooding. And so then that leaves us with the question of, well, what, what is the function? And so if you think about it, these crayfish are living down in those burrows. There's only one, typically there's only one crayfish per burrow. And so our kind of working hypothesis now is that those chimneys are for communication between burrows via pheromones, because they can't directly contact each other. But the wind, so if you have air coming out of this chimney, it's picking up pheromones, bringing it downwind to this burrow, coming down into that entrance where this crayfish can now sense those pheromones, and then it goes out and, and so on and so forth. And so pheromones and crayfish in the water environment have actually been pretty well studied, and they do produce pheromones for sex identification, female receptivity, and modification of aggression. So what about in burrows? This is kind of a wide open area, but we've got some um, indication that this might be going on in the burrows. So in, a, in another lab and then in my lab, we've done a lot of studies that su suggest that these chimneys actually function as signal towers. So if in one experiment we put, um, we, we handmade chimneys, and then we had chimneys that were made by a conspecific, and then we had chimneys that were made by a crayfish of a different species. And we put those at different sections of the kiddie pool, and we released a bunch of juvenile crayfish in the middle of, of that pool. And uh, a significantly greater proportion of those juveniles all went to that chimney that was built by the conspecific. If we do a similar experiment in our burrowing chambers, 
where some previous work with the burrowing chambers um, let us know what kind of soil the crayfish like and what kind they don't like. And so if we would put an adult crayfish and it would build a chimney, in, but we made it build it in sand, which they don't like, we put the juvenile in that burrowing chamber, it would immediately go over and burrow in the sand right next to that adult and ignore the good soil. And then if we reversed it, it no matter what we did, it would always follow the adult. So, so we think that those pheromones may also be used to guide, in this particular species, the young of year are, um, the eggs hatch in a local water body, and those young of year develop for a short period of time in the water, and then they have to migrate inland to find a colony of their conspecifics. And so it's likely when that air is coming up and through that chimney, it's carrying pheromones that are telling those juvenile crayfish, oh, here's, here's where all of the conspecifics are, and kind of guiding them to that area. Um, it also probably gives some really good cues as to gender proximity and receptivity. So if a male is here, you can tell when a female is nearby and when she might be receptive for mating. And also, um, it may help to indicate when, what molt stage individuals are in and when they're getting ready to molt and when they're ready to go from uh, a non-reproductive mode to a reproductive mode. So again, a, a lot of really cool things now to kind of uh, start looking at. And so, um, so that's kind of it. And so what I, I hope I've kind of illustrated to you is that I think kind of pulling together these various um, areas of physiology, engineering, ecology, and so on really provides some fertile grounds for interdisciplinary research and conservation. And so with that, I'd be glad to take any questions. And uh, of course, I didn't do all this work myself. We worked with a lot of collaborators from Auburn, from uh, Jacksonville State University, from the Missouri Department of Conservation, and um, including biologists and engineers. And we had a, a large number, even more than are listed here, of students and postdocs that volunteered and worked on, this, on these projects. And uh, so with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, yeah. These were all these were all adult individuals, so they would molt. It was a difficult study because they only molted maybe once or twice a year, and so we had to follow them through a long time. And incidentally, after we had conducted that for almost a year, I learned why it's not a good idea to have your lab or your class come into your lab and try to do work because it, they got the crayfish mixed mixed up, and that whole experiment was ruined. But we were able to follow it for about a, a year or so, but uh, but yeah, you're right. If you know, if we had been working with younger juveniles, that the mold stages would have occurred a lot more frequently. And yeah, well, those times are even for the adults. Just that whole period of forming that new exoskeleton takes takes a, a long, long. Time. So some of that comes from the aquaculture literature where they're kind of concerned with, you know, in their cultures, when are these animals molting or not. So I think even in the adults, that pre-molt, not the late pre-molt, but the whole pre-molt stage does take up a pretty large proportion of their life cycle, even though they're only molting once or twice a year. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, I think that's, I think that's, so there's a, a researcher over in Romania who's really interested in that question. So he's, he's kind of put together an international team to kind of look at that where he, everybody's supposed to use a very similar setup and we're exposing crayfish to different, um, to anoxic conditions and seeing how long they survive. So basically we need to do some studies like that with, the freshly molted crayfish to see how long they can survive that anoxia and, and, and to prove that they really do die more quickly when they're in the molt stage than, than when they're in intermolt. So I know that they can survive short periods of time of anoxia because when we did our 
respirometry experiments, you know, we let them take the oxygen all the way down to zero, and then we, we stopped the experiment, and they were, we had very little mortality. So they can, they're tolerant of it for a certain point, but I, I think that's obviously the next step is to start trying to figure out, you know, what, how does that actually affect the time survival? Yep. Do they synchronize their reproduction? In other words, they, when they build the chimneys, do they all do it at the same time, at least in one area? Yeah. Is this an individual ready in the same time? Yeah, so the, for this species, they... They all build their chimneys in, um, from March through maybe late May. And then for the rest of the year, it's really hard to find any chimneys at all. As far as, but there's not a lot known about the life history of that particular species. But in, in general, crayfish species vary. So something like a red swamp crayfish does not have a highly synchronized reproductive period. So, so they have an area of concentration, so they typically mate most in uh, spring to early summer, and then the females hold on to the sperm, and then they'll uh, release their eggs in uh, late, mid to late summer. But there's other crayfish species that have a very highly synchronized molt, and they're all mate at the same time, and then release their eggs. So it's, it's very species specific. But the, the chimneys for this species were very seasonal, and that's what kind of made us interested in, and, and kind of provided more evidence that it might be related to a, a cycle like a mating cycle. Does that answer your, your question? Yeah, yeah. No, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It could be something like that, yeah. And we did find males down in the burrows with buried and glared females. So it looks like those males are seeking them out and going down there to mate, and they may guard those females for a certain period of time against other males as well. No, because we never found the buried females in, well, we found the one, actually, we found the one glared female in a plug burrow, so possibly. The other buried females were all in the open burrows, and the chimneys had just weathered, and they weren't rebuilt at that time. Yep. Um, so I have two questions. Okay. Uh, so uh, it depends. <laughs> I'll give you an ecologist answer because it always depends, right? It depends on how wet the soil is, what, it, what it's made of, and so on. For this species, when we have, um, so say we have a, a burrowing chamber set up and you know a tabletop chamber, maybe about this side, they could go down in those chambers down to the groundwater easily overnight. So, so pretty quickly. And, but in a natural setting where they might encounter a lot of rocks and roots and the ground might be a little harder, you know, it might take a little bit longer. Okay. And so usually what we see is um, when those juveniles are coming out of the stream, they'll first actually start to dig burrows in the softer substrate near the stream, and then they start to gradually move inland. So if you look at burrow diameter, it's really small near the stream side. And then it starts to increase as they're kind of migrating in. So the bigger individuals are able to get through that dirt a little bit easier and dig down. But probably, I mean, they may really time it with the rains if they have to initiate a new burrow. Because you know, if it's dry during a drought, they're going to have a really tough time getting down there. But if, right after rain, they can get down. And then I think they just gradually enlarge that over time. And the groundwater doesn't stay stable. It's going up and down. So they're probably continually digging that down. So when we find a really deep burrow, it might just be because that groundwater had gone down and they you know, may have recently excavated that to get all the way down there. But the other times of the year, the water is near the surface and they don't have to go down that far. I'll probably never look at um, one of those chimneys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you're, you're used to just kicking them over. <laughs> but there's, they serve a purpose. Yeah. Um, also, I noticed on your map for your abundance densities, um, you use environmental Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, and this was with the Missouri yeah. crayfish. Yeah, I think that they went out and they used kick stains, okay. and and that, I, I'm pretty sure that they did.